Hare Krishna to all the devotees here and to the devotees watching. Uh, just as a by way of introduction, uh, we're speaking in English and we're not having any translation here. So uh, if you want to do translation, then you should go to different quarters, Hungarian quarter, Russian corner, Turkish corner, uh, Bulgarian quarter. I don't know if there's anybody left here. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if all the different languages understand what I was saying. <laughs> Uh, we will not be uh, translating, it slows down the exchange, and uh, so uh, divide yourselves according to language, and uh, over there there's lots of room, so I suggest those who don't understand English, then, uh, then you have some translation, everybody's okay. No? Hmm. Okay. And I would like to welcome Devamrita Swami Maharaj to New Brajadam. Okay, we didn't need translation for that. Uh, I don't know, this is first time since when? Since before COVID, I guess 2019. Who's going to start having like a date era before COVID, okay. BC. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, it's lovely to see Maharaj back again. And uh, what we will be doing in the next few days is what we do when we're in Mayapur together, usually with Niranjan Swami Maharaj. And uh, that is that uh, we read uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita more times than not. And, uh, and then as we go along, if there's some particular points that come up, then we, we talk. Uh, well, there's probably certain, uh, certain kind of topics that we may not be talking about here that we talk about if we're just together, but uh, but other than that, now that I've raised your uh, curiosity, other than that, we'll be uh, speaking uh, whatever whatever comes to the heart. And Maharaj has selected uh, some place. And where is where should I go? Uh, in the introduction. Uh, uh, Prabhupada's introduction, 
after quite a few paragraphs, because it's a long introduction. I, I uh, there are quotes. If you go, I can find it by quote. Um, What's your nearest quote? A, a, a verse quoted from Bhagavad Gita or a sentence? Y yeah, what, no, no, whatever verses you have, Prabhupada, keep this Bhagavad Gita quote. Uh, uh, 9.32. 9 Am Gunevya. No, um, Bhagavad Gita. I see a ver in the Bhagavad Gita 9.32, Lord Krishna says. Maybe I could find it real quick. The Sanskrit's not there. Oh, 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 oh. Is there some Sanskrit verse nearby? No, it begins, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu informs us. Hare Krishna, everybody. Um, th thank you uh, for attending. We're just looking up a spot. And uh, our sort of experience with uh, these readings is that uh, it allows us to go uh, deeply into certain topics and uh, sometimes we don't get very far, sometimes we don't do more than a paragraph. Okay, we got it. Uh, sometimes we don't get so far uh, in terms of the reading, but we try to analyze things from different perspectives uh, and also make some reference from other sources uh, if they're available, uh, such as our acharyas and so on. Okay, so I'll let Maharaj read since he selected. We're starting just to warm us up in a section of the introduction to Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is a compilation of five lectures Prabhupada gave in the early days of ISKCON. Chaitanya Ma just one, uh, just reminds me that if, uh, if you want to know where we are, uh, then, well, uh, we are in the introduction uh, from my book, you're sort of seven pages in to the introduction to Chaitanya Charitamrita. And this is a paragraph that begins. The paragraph, it begins different in, uh, on my e-reader than it does. So. Uh -huh. uh, f this is, uh, there is a, uh, there is the Sanskrit quote, Namo Maham Vadanyaya. And if you go uh, one, two, three, four, five, six paragraphs after that, then you will see this Chaitanya Mahaprabhu informs us. It is the fifth line uh, of a paragraph that begins, in material consciousness we are trying to love. Uh, so that's where we are right now, if you want to 
uh, follow, try and follow that, then you get to find it. You got, you got it. Okay. All right. That's it. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu informs us that in every country and in every scripture, there is some hint of love of Godhead. But no one knows what love of Godhead actually is. The Vedic scriptures, however, are different in that they can direct the individual in the proper way to love God. Other scriptures do not give information on how one can love God, nor do they actually define or describe what or who the Godhead actually is. Mm. So this sounds simultaneously sectarian and non-sectarian. <laughs> I was just listening to a talk, Prabhupada's talking with uh, devotees, and yeah, he was pointing out this very same thing. It may have even been a lecture with Prabhupada saying that although there are many scriptures that talk about God, uh, yet very few people have an idea of what God is, who God is. Uh, it's not sectarian, it's just reality. Well, well it starts off non-sectarian that in every country and in every scripture there's some hint of love of God. Eh? Hint. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in Christianity, thou shalt love the Lord. How? I had this uh, talk just at uh, Rathiatra. I mentioned there was this uh, Christian. First when we were just practicing, setting up the sound, then people were sitting around and I saw somebody reading a Bhagavad Gita right at the very beginning. And I mean, he was really intently reading. And then later on when we had, a few hours later, uh, in my tent, questions and answers, he came up, he was a real born-again Christian, like real born-again, but very, very polite, very nice. And uh, he said he uh, read to the end of the second chapter, then he started quoting and asking questions. But this whole concept of love, he said, yes, Jesus loves us, God loves us, uh, we love him. And then when I tried to sort of challenge him, that, well, what you call love isn't real love. It's just maybe some kind of affection. Uh, we argued, but he was very, very polite. Uh, very, very respectful, actually, of, uh, of the Gita. But what, what's, they don't know. They don't know what love is. I tried to point out that they are nicely focused on Jesus as the representative or the son of God, but he himself said that he said very little about his father. So it seems they overcompensate for that lack by focusing totally on Jesus, although Jesus talked about his father. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I don't know so much about other scriptures. I don't have that much experience. But Bible, yes. Uh, remember, I had my confirmation. Confirmation? You didn't have confirmation? Confirmation is... I you know, but I, uh, in, in Judaism, there's confirmation? Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I went to church. I mean, I, and when I was about... 13 or 14, we had confirmation, and for a whole year we were studying with the priests on Saturdays. Oh. Can you imagine that? My whole Saturdays being spent with, and then we had, uh, I got confirmed. Well, yeah, I, I got confirmed too. In our house, every day was Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> there was no Bible study in our house. <laughs> Yeah, your mother was very religious, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, Maharaj told me that his, uh, his mother prayed that he would become a real devotee of God, that she would give birth to a real devotee of God. <laughs> and then? Well, 
Yes, she, she, she confessed that while I was being conceived, she was praying to God to send her a servant of the Lord. So I told her, well, maybe slightly, a little bit, your prayer was sort of fulfilled. And then she said, well, I meant for Jesus, not for Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> So I told her that next time she should be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems here, first it starts off ecumenical and interfaith and non-sectarian. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu informs us that in every country and in every scripture there's some hint of love of God in. But then we become more exclusivist. But no one knows what love of God it actually is. The Vedic scriptures, however, are different in that they can direct the individual in the proper way to love God. Other scriptures do not give information on how one can love God, nor do they actually define or describe what or who the Godhead actually is. Although they officially promote love of Godhead, they have no idea how to execute it. So he's giving credit. They officially promote love of Godhead. And we give them credit for that. But no idea the process for loving God. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives a practical demonstration of how to love God in a conjugal relationship. Seems Prabhupada here is heading for deep water. <laughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives a practical demonstration of how to love God in a conjugal relationship. Taking the part of Srimati Radharani, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu tried to love Krishna as Radharani loved him. Krishna was always amazed by Radharani's love. How does Radharani give me such pleasure? He would ask. In order to study Radharani, Krishna lived in her role and tried to understand himself. So he tried to understand himself as Radharani. Try to understand himself as uh, as well as how uh, as himself Krishna. In other words, to try to understand what is uh, what is the sweetness in, in Krishna that induces uh, such great ecstasy in Srimati Radharani. In, in one sense, both both as Radha and as Krishna, isn't it? Um, this is the secret of Lord Chaitanya's incarnation. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna, but he has taken the mood and role of Radharani to show us how to love Krishna. Thus the author writes in the fifth verse, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord who is absorbed in Radharani's thoughts. This brings up the question of who Srimati Radharani is and what Radha Krishna is. Actually, Radha Krishna is the exchange of love, but not ordinary love. Krishna has immense potencies, of which three are principal, the internal, the external, and the marginal potencies. In the internal potency, there are three divisions, samvit, Hladini and Sandini. The Hladini potency is Krishna's pleasure potency. All living entities have this pleasure seeking potency, for all beings are trying to have pleasure. This is the very nature of the living entity. At present, we are trying to enjoy our pleasure potency by the means of the body in the material condition. By bodily contact, we are attempting to derive pleasure from material sense objects. But we should not entertain the nonsensical idea that Krishna, who is always spiritual, 
also tries to seek pleasure on this material plane. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes the material universe as a non-permanent place full of miseries. Why, then, would he seek pleasure in matter? He is the super soul, the supreme spirit, and his pleasure is beyond the material conception. To um, you don't hear Srila Prabhupada's writing that uh, all living entities, if I may quote, uh, the Ladini potency is a pleasure potency. All living entities have this pleasure-seeking potency. Uh, is, uh, is there uh, or isn't there a, a controversy as to whether actually living entities have that uh, innate uh, pleasure-giving potency? Or that uh, that pleasure-giving potency, Ladrini Shakti, is something that you uh, inherit or you get by the association of uh, someone else. There seems to be debates about that. My own perspective is that it's both. Certainly, Prabhupada says that here that uh, every living entity already has uh, that Ladini Shakti contact with Ananda. And in association, it's further brought out? Is that enhanced? That's, that's my understanding also, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so otherwise, what does it mean when Lord Chaitanya is saying uh, the Jivera Swarupoi and the Krishna Das, every living entity is Krishna's eternal servant. And uh, then, what's the quote about love of God, uh, Prema? Uh, what's that quote? Uh, every living entity. I can't hear you. Yeah, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema, Sajya Kabanoi. Yeah, so. It's there, Sadya Kabunoi, Shravanadi Shuddha Trite Kurate Udoi, and then it comes out uh, by Shravan Kirtan, which means by association, or it includes association. So it could, there's something there, and that's further enhanced by the mercy of the Lord and the devotees? Mm. Elsewhere in one purport in Chaitanya Charitamrita in Adi Lila, volume one, Prabhupada writes that love of Godhead means Krishna has bestowed his Haladini Shakti on you. Uh -huh. So it seems you could go from both ways that it's something inherent and also something enhanced. I, I find in my reading of Chaitanya Charitamrita that it, 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 sometimes this way is stressed, sometimes the other way is stressed, mm -hmm. but both are given. I think it's why Prabhupada gives the example that in wood, fire is already there in wood, but it takes fire to bring it out. And with that fire then, the inherent fire also starts to blaze. Some may think this discussion is technical, but actually it's so uh, profound because it's dealing with real love. It's not just some kind of theological armchair speculation. It's this, this introduction that Prabhupada's writing, it, it's stated so clearly that sometimes we may think it's simple, but actually the statements I find are so mm. profound it takes a lot of thought. My question then is when we say fine, Ladini is in everyone, love is in everyone's heart, and then it takes further association, Shravanadi Shuddha Chitti Kurite Udoi to bring it out. Uh, does that mean that you have to associate with someone who has love? 
I would think so. Yesterday we were reading about, at least I was reading about eagerness. And Prabhupada was saying that he was talking about this lolium. And, oh, it is not ordinary, though. You, you may think you know what it is, but it's this greed, this eagerness for Krishna is not ordinary, but it comes through association. Hmm. So does that mean that association has to be a lover of God? So unless you have guru or other senior devotees who actually have prema, then your own prema won't come out? Somewhere along the line, somewhere in the mix of a devotee's life, there has to be that contact. Uh, I, I think we're getting that contact at least by reading these, these sections of Chaitanya Jerry Tamrita, and then certainly there are other contemporary associations. Some, some say you need the physical association, isn't it? Yes, but I never read Prabhupada <laughs> saying that. I just, <laughs> in fact, I remember uh, filing his letters in Los Angeles, and I read one where he said, actually, the Vapu physical association is for neophytes. <laughs> so the advanced devotee associates to the Vani. And he explained that the Vani is more in, intense association than the Vapu, which is, I would think, is hard to understand if we're in the bodily conception of life. We're still influenced or tinged by it. We're so prone for physical association, and that it's hard for us to conceive how the Vani could be more intense association. Yeah, they have that, uh, those people who promote that say you have to hear from the lips of a pure devotee. But the, <laughs> just like you're doing your podcast, the lips are moving, but <laughs> the sound vibration <laughs> is going everywhere. <laughs> Okay, so they, how can they, someone say they're not hearing from the lips? <laughs> and, you know, we always talk about Krishna, Krishna's instruction, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's instruction, that that's the essence. So that this vani is, uh, is really for advanced devotees. Uh, it's there. We're, by associating with Chaitanya Chaitamita, you associate with Kaviraj Goswami and Srila Prabhupada, and then... Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So definitely devotees, uh, if they're in a situation where they don't think their guru has love of God, at least all these other sources do. To learn how Krishna enjoys pleasure, we must study the first nine cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam and then we should study the 10th canto, in which Krishna's pleasure potency is displayed in his pastimes with Radha Rani and the damsels of Braja. I love just this, these words, to learn how Krishna enjoys pleasure. Why should we care how Krishna enjoys pleasure if we're so wrapped up in our own selfish, materialistic concerns? But it, uh, I just find these words are like the beginning of a symphony to learn how Krishna enjoys pleasure. <laughs> Unfortunately, unintelligent people turn at once to the sports of Krishna in the Dashama Skanda, the 10th canto. Krishna's embracing Radharani or his dancing with the cowherd girls in the Rasa dance are generally not understood by ordinary men because they consider these pastimes in the light of mundane lust. This happened to me just at a program at the uh, Dira Kutir uh, Friday night. One, it was time for questions and one person who knew a little something about Bhakti, he raised the question. He raised his hand and said, well, 
well, why is it that Krishna gets to have girlfriends? <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> So I had to set him straight uh, <laughs> and tell him that he's, tr he's tried to imitate Krishna and he's failed miserably. And he agreed. He said, yes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, that program? Yes, there were about 50 persons there at the um, Dira Kutir. It's a well-placed place. Mm -hmm. But I was remarking to the audience, I've been to cities all over the world, and I know it was Friday night. So I, you expect to see some couples going here and there, but I've never seen a city where this is going on at 5 p.m. <laughs> Everywhere else, 5 p.m. means people are scurrying from work, trying to get home and uh, uh, prepare to go out at 9 p.m. So like in, in, in New York or Australia or Sydney or Los Angeles, you don't see people just arm in arm at five, couples arm in arm at 5 p.m. just strolling casually. You, you don't see that until 9 p.m. at night they, because first they go home, they get dressed up or they whatever, and then 9, 9 p.m. on Friday they come out, the couples. But in Budapest, I, I, I was shocked. <laughs> Everywhere I looked, there were arm in arm couples at 5 p.m. <laughs> so you just see how we are so fixated upon imitating Krishna and Radharani. Our enjoyment is for real and Radha Krishna is mythological. That's our problem. You never Notice that I mean, you've been in Budapest so long, but it's, they get out early. These, <laughs> I was, it was shocking. <laughs> I don't. Maybe it's there. It's a whole university quarter, and there's so many students out there. Even before we got to the university quarter, I, I was watching. I, I studied the people on the street. <laughs> it's five maybe p.m. I just got used to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked the guests at the Dira Kutir. Uh, what's going on? I, uh, it seems to me that you guys can't tolerate being alone. And they all said, yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> we got to be with someone. <laughs> you can't enjoy alone. <laughs> Some people think, thus... Some people thus become interested in Krishna because they think that his religion allows indulgence in sex. This is not Krishna bhakti, love of Krishna, but prakrita sahajya, materialistic love. To avoid such errors, we should understand what Radha Krishna actually is. Radha and Krishna display their pastimes through Krishna's internal energy. The pleasure potency of Krishna's internal energy is a most difficult subject matter. And unless one understands what Krishna is, one cannot understand it. Krishna does not take any pleasure in this material world, but he has a pleasure potency. Because we are part and parcel of Krishna, the pleasure potency is within us also. But... We are trying to exhibit that pleasure potency in matter. Krishna, however, does not make such a vain attempt. The object of Krishna's pleasure potency is Radharani. Krishna exhibits his potency as Radharani and then engages in loving affairs with her. In other words, Krishna does not take pleasure in this external energy but exhibits his internal energy, his pleasure potency as Radharani, and then enjoys with her. Thus, Krishna manifests himself as Radharani in order to enjoy his internal pleasure potency. Of the many extensions, expansions, and incarnations of the Lord, 
This pleasure potency is the foremost and chief. It is not that Radharani is separate from Krishna. Radharani is also Krishna, for there is no difference between the energy and the energetic. Without energy, there is no meaning to the energetic. And without the energetic, there is no energy. Similarly, without Radha, there is no meaning to Krishna. And without Krishna, there is no meaning to Radha. <laughs> okay, we're ready for an exposition. <laughs> Because of this, the Vaishnava philosophy, first of all, pays obeisances to and worships the internal potency, the internal pleasure potency of the Supreme Lord. Thus, the Lord and his potency are always referred to as Radha Krishna. Similarly, those who worship Narayana, first of all, utter the name of Lakshmi as Lakshmi Narayana. Similarly, those who worship Lord Rama, first of all, utter the name of Sita, in any case, Sita Rama, Radha Krishna, Lakshmi Narayana, the potency always comes first. Radha and Krishna are one. And when Krishna desires to enjoy pleasure, he manifests himself as Radha Rani. The spiritual exchange of love between Radha and Krishna is the actual display of Krishna's internal pleasure potency. Although we speak of when Krishna desires, just when he did desire, we cannot say. We only speak in this way because in conditioned life, we take it that everything has a beginning. However, in spiritual life, everything is absolute, and so there is neither beginning nor end. Yet, in order to understand that Radha and Krishna are one, and that they also become divided, the question when automatically comes to mind. When Krishna desired to enjoy his pleasure potency, he manifested himself in the separate form of Radharani. And when he wanted to understand himself through the agency of Radha, he united with Radharani and that unification is called Lord Chaitanya. This is all explained by Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj in the fifth verse of the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So that section I, I just meditate on again and again. And we were discussing topics related to this section Sunday in Budapest. Let me, if you want, we can go to Majulila chapter two. Or mm -hmm. well, I just mm. uh, noted that Srila Prabhupada, you know, we, uh, we were talking about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Krishna we're just manifesting the uh, bhava and uh, duty, the uh, mood and uh, effulgence, or is Krishna actually, uh, or is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually the form of Radha and Krishna combined? So Prabhupada had said both. Earlier, he, he said that uh, Krishna is, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna with the mood, and now here he's concluding this paragraph by uh, saying that uh, when he wanted to understand himself in interest of Radha, he united with Radharani. In other words, it more or less the two became one, as some people say. Uh, and uh, so they united uh, in the form of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It's amazing how different this is than what you're reading. Mm. Really did.
you know, this concept of when, when, when did, when does something uh, happen? Devotees often get caught up on that. Well, when, when in time did it happen? It's, it's just uh, eternally going on. What well, about the statement, Radha Krishna is the exchange of love? And, uh, and Kaviraj Goswami, he's in fourth chapter of Adi Lila, so he's talking about that Krishna says, oh, I'm going to descend uh, and uh, with my associates uh, exhibit this loving exchange and take on the mood of Radharani. Sounds like at some time, there was, he was there in the spiritual world, and now I decided, I'm deciding to do this. Uh, and that, well, before that, uh, that wasn't like that. So there's this sort of sense, or Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikriti Aladini Shakti Rasmad, that yes, they, Radha and Krishna unite uh, so we're going to get to one of these inconceivable things that, that Krishna, that because you have this, uh, it can't be something that's uh, just always divine. In other words, all full of uh, uh, all full of Aishwarya. That uh, in, in sort of a human, in a human lila. Uh, then Krishna is always acting that, you know, there was a past, there's a present, there's going to be a future, even though it's actually all eternal mm -hmm. present. So it sort of brings up the question, when Krishna decides to do this, is he in this mood of Bhagavan, Supreme Personality of Godhead, or is he just in the midst of really his pastimes in Vrindavan uh, and... Uh, this sort of when comes in as a phenomena that would be natural uh, to Krishna uh, in uh, in a Brindavan mood, in a as he's a, he's just a cowherd boy. So now I'm going to do that. Hmm. Although the whole background, or you might say, is eternal. Yes. But in, as part of his spontaneous Braj Lila, oh, now I'll do this. Now. <laughs> yeah, even though, even though I'm just a cowherd, boy, but I think I'm going to take that mood of right <laughs> around. Uh, where in Madhya Lila? Chapter 2. Do you usually read the chapter summary or go right to, we'll go right to the first verse? Mm-hmm. While relating in synopsis form the last division of the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in this chapter I shall describe the Lord's transcendental ecstasy, which appears like madness due to his separation from Krishna. Purport. In this second chapter, the activities of Lord Chaitanya that took place after the Lord accepted sannyas are generally described. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is specifically mentioned here as being Gora or of fair complexion. Krishna is generally known to be blackish, but when he is absorbed in the thought of the gopis, who are all of fair complexion, Krishna himself also becomes fair. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, in particular, felt separation from Krishna very deeply exactly like a lover who is dejected in separation from the beloved. Such feelings, which were expressed by Sri Titanya Mahaprabhu for nearly 12 years at the end of his pastimes, are described in brief in this second chapter of Majja Leela. Hmm. 
Jai Jai Sri Chaitanya Jai Nichananda Jai Dwaita Chandra Jai Gaur Bhakta Vrinda. All glories to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all glories to Lord Nityananda, all glories to Advaita Chandra, and all glories to all the devotees of the Lord. During his last 12 years, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu always manifested all the symptoms of ecstasy in separation from Krishna. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's state of mind, day and night, was practically identical to Radharani's state of mind when Uddhava came to Vrindavan to see the gopis. I always wonder about this state of mind, practically identical to Radharani's state of mind. It seems the state of mind is so important in bhava and praying. Important even uh, when we're practicing in, in sadhana, because Prabhupada keeps uh, talking about uh, us trying to experience this mood of separation. You have to feel uh, separation from Krishna. Uh, and how do, you, how do you feel it? Well, you share what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is feeling. Uh, all of these, uh, these books actually teach us how to uh, experience separation. And it's not something that we should just read or oh, someone else is doing and it's some reading matter but uh, it's actually something that we need to adopt. And Prabhupada keeps repeating, just try to feel. Usually Prabhupada wasn't the person who was talking about feelings. He's talking about following the rules and regulations. But when it comes to separation, he's very adamant that we need to cultivate a mood of separation, recognize that we're actually distant from Krishna. I mean, that's not too difficult to understand because here we are. Well, how, how would you say that process of cultivating a mood of separation from Krishna, how does that begin? By hearing. Shavanadi Shuddha Chitte Korate Udoi. That we, we just hear and really share our hearts, uh, allow, allow what we're hearing. Uh, to become, we become one. Uh, Guru Mukha uh, Padma Vakya, Chite Te Koriya Aikya. That, uh, that Chite Te Koriya Aikya, that our consciousness becomes one with that which we hear. Uh, and, and then it rubs off. So someone would then ask, well, how does one hear with such in concentration and intensity? So, so that this dynamic, transformative experience that you describe actually happens. Yeah, that's, that's what it's about, learning how to hear. <laughs> Krishna consciousness is uh, it's a very serious business, and uh, it's not just some um, recreation. But uh, it's a very, uh, very elaborate, in one sense, it's a very uh, challenging thing that this is the most most complex thing to learn, and a lot of it you're left to be. It's like uh, you know, a correspondence course. Uh, you're supposed to learn brain surgery via correspondence course uh, instead of actually being there with the professors moment by moment. Uh, so we have we have our classes, we have our association, but devotees are left to really go deeply into uh, these books uh, and learn Shushudho Shodadanascha. Uh, according to your faith, you will be able to read accordingly. I find that, and I was t talking about this Friday at the Dira Kutir, to the newcomers, I was telling them, look, we're not going through all this endeavor just to introduce religious beliefs to you. <laughs> we're actually 
presenting a transformative experience. We're not just presenting dogma, doctrine, or theology. This bhakti process lives and has unlimited depth. Because I noticed that often there's this fear amongst the contemporary mindset that, uh-oh, the last thing I want is to be a religious believer. <laughs> but everyone wants to experience. Mm -hmm. It is a real experience. Um, I saw that when we had the Krathyatra, when, when we had Kirtan, we were doing Kirtan, we had, I don't know, we had hundreds and hundreds of people there. And uh, then at a certain point, they started dancing. I don't know, they were dancing here, they were dancing behind us. And uh, that ultimately, no matter you know how much we talk, and everything to people, but people really get it when there's a kirtan. <laughs> so it's ultimately through the holy name that that real experience comes. So someone could ask, well, what's so special about the, the Krishna kirtan? It, it, you go to an evangelical church and they're singing their songs and they're raising their hand in the air, you know, like that. And <laughs> so what's so special about our kirtan that we want everyone to participate? And what do you say? I say, well, the Hare Krishna mantra is not ordinary sound. It's prescribed in the yoga texts. As <laughs> <laughs> as the, the best way for achieving the top rung of the yoga ladder, <laughs> which is love of Krishna, the love supreme. Because <laughs> I find often that they think that, well, th these people are singing hymns, you're making a kirtan. We admit the kirtan for some reason relaxes us and removes our anxiety, but that's about as far as we know. So then the question might be, how much can you tell them, a newcomer, about the intimacy of Krishna Kirtan? It's a transcendental sound vibration, whereas, uh, whereas you may be singing hallelujah, praise the Lord, etc., but you're not singing the names of God. Mm -hmm. They're not doing that, are they? No. No. So... They're not seeing the names of God. For Prabhupada, you know, in Australia, he got to that thing, all right, then chant the names of Jesus. Uh, and when he was with that religious uh, group, they really received him very nicely. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, remember what denomination they were? Some kind of Catholic yeah. monks near yeah. Melbourne, Australia. And uh, Prabhupada said, all right, but then chant the name of Jesus. So you may be praising the Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah, but where, where's the name of God? And unless you're chanting the name of God, you can't get the same realization. And then there are different names of God. And the names of God that relate to his pastimes are different than the names of God as related to his creation and so on. And that was what we were exchanging about this morning, just trying to get an answer to, uh, to some other names, which, uh, which is sort of pastimes, but related to killing of demons, whether they are primary or secondary. Nuranji Maharaj also said that they were secondary. And, uh, Kali Adama. I, I mean, so that they were uh, primary yes. that they were, and KB Maharaj as well. Mm. Mm. Reminds me of just a conversation I had with my mother last week, and sh she'll always end the conversation. She's, she's 94, but she won't give up. And remember, son, I love you, and there's only one name by which we can be saved. <laughs> <laughs> I said, 
Mother, how many names do you have? <laughs> You've got a first name, a middle name, and a last name. So <laughs> why is it that the infinite Supreme Lord can only have one name? Oh, you think you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with you guys. You always have the answers to everything. <laughs> So we were commenting about Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's state of mind. Day and night was practically identical to Radharani's state of mind when Uddhava came to Vrindavan to see the gopis. Am I going to do all the reading? Or hmm? Am I going to do all the reading? Or? No, I'm, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, my, it'll be a little different. Yes. Because I have the first first edition, uh -huh. ones that came out mm -hmm. every two weeks, a new volume. Uh -huh. It was a great experience. And, uh, yeah. The small room beyond the corridor is called the Gambira. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to stay in that room. Are we, did we skip, Amaraj, did we skip text five? Oh, we're going, text five, weren't yes. it? The Lord constantly exhibited a state of mind reflecting the madness of separation. All his activities were based on forgetfulness and his talks were always based on madness. Blood flowed from the pores of his body and all his teeth were loosened. At one moment his whole body became slender and at another moment his whole body became fat. The small room beyond the corridor is called the Gambira. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to stay in that room, but he did not sleep for a moment. All night, he used to grind his mouth and head on the ground, and his face sustained injuries all over. Although the three doors of the house were always closed, the Lord would nonetheless go out and sometimes would be found at Jagannath Temple before the gate known as Singhadwara. And sometimes the Lord would fall flat into the sea. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would also run very fast across the sand hills, mistaking them to be Govardhan. As he ran, he would wail and cry loudly. Purport. Because of the winds of the sea, sometimes the sand would form dunes. Such sand dunes are called Chataka Parvat. Instead of seeing these dunes simply as hills of sand, the Lord would take them to be Govardhan Hill. Sometimes he would run towards these dunes at high speed, crying very loudly, expressing the state of mind exhibited by Radharani. The Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and his pastimes. His state of mind brought him the atmosphere of Vrindavan and Govardhan Hill, and thus he enjoyed the transcendental bliss of separation and meeting. You know, just one uh, point, and that is that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu always experienced the mood of Srimati Radharani when Krishna, uh, Krishna left for Mathura and when Uddhava came and relayed Krishna's message that moves separation. Uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, we, we don't read about that. In other words, we don't specifically read about Srimad Yadarani and Srimad Bhagavatam uh, when Krishna is leaving. We hear about the gopis generically but we don't hear about uh, her specifically. Um, that's, that's only there in other, other scriptures, other books. Uh, and even about uh, Uddhava when he comes in Bhagavatam, there's just the Brahma Gita. Uh, that, uh, those ten verses, uh, Radharani is speaking to the bee. Other than that, uh, in the books that we have, we don't, uh, 
we don't really have any detailed information of how was Srimati Radharani feeling. So which books would that be in? Uh, like... Uh, Hamsa Dutta or Uddhava Sandesh? Or? Hamsa Dutta, very, very much so. And then the uh, Garga Samhita. Garg, but it's, it, it doesn't have the same rasa mm. as either Bhagavatam or things written by Rupa Goswami. Uh, yeah, Hamsa Dutta is like a real tearjerker. Yes. Uddhava Sandesh also? Uddhava Sandesh somewhat. Mm -hmm. Somewhat. Uh, there it's Krishna talking. Anyway, that becomes the responsibility of the devotee to uh, ultimately see, well, what is this mood when Krishna leaves uh, Vrindavan? when we're separated from Krishna. Um, Can the devotee see that mood by studying Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who's demonstrating that? Or? We certainly uh, have different uh, descriptions of Lord Chaitanya experiencing that separation. Uh, very, very exalted states of, uh, of consciousness unique. They're actually unique to Lord Chaitanya. So even though devotees can cultivate their own, uh, they're not going to come to the stage of Lord Chaitanya and Srimati Vadarani. I love the statement, his state of mind brought him the atmosphere of Vrindavan and Govardhan Hill. Hmm. When he returned to Jagannath Puri after having attempted to go to Vrindavan, and he was saying, I had to come back because Gadadhar Pandit wouldn't let me go. And Gadadhar Pandit said, Well, where, you're bringing Vrindavan with you wherever you go. You don't have to f physically go to Vrindavan. And during the Ratha Yatra, it's described by Kavaraj Goswami, that Mura Mana Vrindavana. Hmm. My mind is Vrindavan and the pastimes of Vrindavan are constantly taking place in it. The Srila Prabhupada emphasizes that concept so often that uh, Vrindavan is a state of mind, a state of consciousness. It's not a physical place. And uh, wherever, wherever a pure devotee chants Hare Krishna, wherever they're in the right consciousness, then Vrindavan manifests. Uh, so does that mean New Brajadam could actually be Vrindavan? The whole idea of New Brajadam is to present uh, all the opportunities for devotees to be in Vrindavan and be Krishna conscious, so the things that actually inspire their uh, memories. And then, of course, it's Vrindavan because Radhi Sham are here. Uh, so it would depend on the individual resident of New Rajadam how much they are. Yeah, uh, the, the mood of uh, New Brajadam is certainly very much dependent on, uh, or Bra New Brajadam is certainly dependent on the Krishna consciousness of the members. I mean, it's like you go to Vrindavan, Vrindavan is Vrindavan, and it has its own atmosphere, but at the same time, you know, sometimes when either things happen, I don't know when you get... Uh, harassed constantly by pandas or something like that, or when uh, people see how dirt and uh, so many other things, the sewage, open sewage running, these things uh, really disturb their minds and they ha uh, have difficulty in appreciating uh, the mood of Vrindavan. 
so the wrong type of activities can sort of cover the mood of Vrindavan in the individual's minds, and the right type of uh, activities can uh, manifest it increasingly. How long are we going to? It's up to you. <laughs> uh, well, we planned 8.30, but we're missing the Ranjan Maharaj. Threesome is easier than a twosome. <laughs> Sometimes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu mistook the small parks of the city for Vrindavan. Sometimes he would go there, dance and chant, and sometimes fall unconscious in spiritual ecstasy. The extraordinary transformations of the body due to transcendental feelings would never have been possible for anyone but the Lord, in whose body all transformations were manifest. Purport. The ecstatic transformations of the body as described in such exalted literatures as Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu are practically not seen in this material world. However, these symptoms were perfectly present in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. These symptoms are indicative of Mahabhav, or the highest ecstasy. Sometimes Sahajas artificially imitate these symptoms, but experienced devotees reject them immediately. The author admits herein that these symptoms are not to be found anywhere but in the body of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Does this in one sense reflect to you that uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifests those symptoms, some of which are, uh, not all of which, but some of which are uh, to be shared by his associates, uh, but uh, as practicing devotees, uh, we don't necessarily see these, we don't attain these states of devotion. Uh, in this lifetime, Prabhupada says here, in, in the material world, uh, we don't experience these things. Well, Lord Chaitanya actually showed all of these, uh, prema and bhav and mahabhav. Would never have been possible for anyone but the Lord, in whose body all transformations were manifest. So we are saying that Mahaprabhu is demonstrating ecstatic symptoms that are just beyond the reach of jivas. Well, there's some that are beyond the reach of jivas. There's some that are like beyond the reach of sadhakas, mm. who he's come to reclaim. Mm. That even if they attain, uh, it's very rare that someone's going to attain prema in this life. You know, they may attain bhava. Uh, but to convince that these things exist, and uh, what they're like, and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, actually presented all of these. We, uh, we get little information about his associates and what experiences they had. For instance, when Ramananda Roy and Swarup Damodar Goswami are with them, we always hear about all the madness of Lord Chaitanya uh, and just hearing uh, all the pastimes. But they themselves are, you know, it seems like they just sort of stayed in their role as facilitators uh, and uh, never re uh, really, at least in Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's not like that, and never really sort of entered into a... a other moods uh, of ecstatic devotion. There's this uh, really nice little ashtakam by uh, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur about Swarup Damodar Goswami and the exchanges between Lord Chaitanya and Swarup Damodar. And there he sometimes calls, uh, calls Swarup Damodar Lalita, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And we were just uh, singing also a song during the uh, Abhishek, and uh, that was also how Lord Chaitanya uh, enjoyed 
Jagannath's Abhishek and says to Swarup Damodar Goswami, look, look at your boyfriend, Lalita, look at your boyfriend uh, and how he's uh, being bathed uh, here. But the devotees are always sort of facilitators. Uh, their, their bhavas uh, are not described. Okay. The joints of his hands and legs would sometimes become separated by eight inches, and they remain connected only by the skin. Sometimes Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's hands, legs, and head would all enter within his body, just like the withdrawn limbs of a tortoise. In this way, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to manifest wonderful ecstatic symptoms. His mind appeared vacant, and there were only hopelessness and disappointment in his words. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to express his mind in this way. Where is the Lord of my life who is playing his flute? What shall I do now? Where should I go to find the son of Maharaj Nanda? To whom should I speak? Who can understand my disappointment? Without the son of Nanda Maharaj, my heart is broken. In this way, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu always expressed bewilderment and lamented in separation from Krishna. At such times, he used to read the shlokas of Ramananda Roy's drama, known as Jagannath Balabhanataka. Stana stanam avaiti napi modano janati no durbala. Anyo veda nachanya dukkam akilam no jivanam vashravam dvi trani eva dinani yovanam idam ha ha vidhe ka gati. Shimati Radharani used to lament. Our Krishna does not realize what we have suffered from injuries inflicted in the course of loving affairs. We are actually misused by love because love does not know where to strike and where not to strike. Even Cupid does not know our very weakened condition. What should I tell everyone, anyone? No one can understand another's difficulties. Our life is actually not under our control for youth will remain for two or three days and soon be finished. In this condition, O Creator, what will be our destination? This verse is from Jagannath Balabhanataka of Ramananda Roy. And then, Upajila Prema Kura, Bangila Yedrika Pura, Krishna Tahara Nahi Kaure Pana. Bahire Nagara Raja, Bitare Shatera Kaja, Paranare Vadhe Shava Dana. Shimati Radharani spoke thus In distress due to separation from Krishna. Oh, what shall I say of my distress? After I met Krishna, my loving propensities sprouted, but upon separating from him, I sustained a great shock, which is now continuing like the suffering of a disease. The only physician for this disease is Krishna himself, but he's not taking care of this sprouting plant of devotional service. What can I say about the behavior of Krishna? Outwardly, he is a very attractive young lover, but at heart he is a great cheat, very expert in killing others' wives. Sakihe nabujie vidhina vidana. Sakalagikailun prita haila dukka viparita ebe jaya naraha rahe parana. Shimati Radharani continued lamenting about the consequences of loving Krishna. My dear friend, I do not understand the regulative principles given by the Creator. I left Krishna for happiness but the result was just the opposite. 
I am now in an ocean of distress. It must be that now I'm going to die for my vital force no longer remains. This is my state of mind. So what do people think when we're telling them to chant Hare Krishna and be happy? And uh, they're saying, well, I thought it was for happiness, but the result is just the opposite. Now I'm in an ocean of distress. We don't say anything. <laughs> what can you say? It's uh, extraordinary. By nature, loving affairs are very crooked. They are not entered with sufficient knowledge, nor do they consider whether a place is suitable or not, nor do they look forward to the results. By the ropes of his good qualities, Krishna, who is so unkind, has bound my neck and hands, and I'm unable to get relief. I had one uh, disciple who wrote me that, you know, when I read of these things, Krishna's exchange with Radharani, I just, it, it brings, sounds to me like a sort of a love, love story between a boy and a girl, and it brings back memories of my my own past, so he he preferred not to uh, go in that direction. He just rather hear about uh, Krishna with the coward boys, or just about Krishna's instructions and so on. You have that experience. There's just nothing like this what we're hearing, uh, whatever has gone on in the material history of the conditioned soul is just such a perversion and such a tiny, you know, sukhami tucham, as Prahlad Maharaj says, so insignificant. Uh, it's like if a fly lands on your shoulder, it's just such an insignificant event. Uh, but what we're reading about is unlimitedly deep mm -hmm. so if what isn't the cure for someone who has those memories to just go on hearing and those memories will be cleansed or they have to be as you write in your what is it which is the name of that oh, book Sankalpa Kamudi uh, no the other one the, the Chintamani something Oh, should about teaching. Yes. It's all about qualification, but then again, there's the cure. So, like in Ayurveda, you have to, in order to take some very powerful Ayurvedic medicines, first you have to take some, you have to build up your system, mm. and then the powerful medicine really acts. So, what should such a person do when they have those memories come back. Um. Uh, Jiva Goswami uh, concludes the, uh, his uh, in, uh, Bhakti Sandarbha on uh, Raganuga Bhakti. That, uh, he says, but if uh, if uh, enjoying propensity arises in someone's heart, uh, then, then they should not hear. And then they should. So it seems that, uh, and Prabhupada would often say also that uh, uh, elsewhere that although this is really the medicine, but then yes, if you're not if you're not ready for this powerful medicine yet, then you need to build up uh, with some other preliminary things, which is faith in Krishna, so that actually that uh, faith is there and faith in the transcendental nature of these pastimes. Uh, and that, uh, that will come with the uh, purification of the heart. Uh, I think that that's a, uh, I, I would, uh, I, I generally just uh, recommend uh, to devotees that that's, that's the stepwise process that they should do, like Bhagavatam, uh, that uh, the 
first nine cantos of Bhagavatam are really to get you to know about who God is and who the Supreme Personality of Godhead is. And then, then even you got 30 chapters before Krishna really starts about this Rasa Leela pastimes, which uh, take you through, you know, if you, can, uh, if you can accept that God steals butter mm -hmm. and that, you know, he does all these pranks with his friends and that during the day God herds cows, uh, then eventually you'll come to being able to accept uh, his pastimes with the gopis. Well, someone could say, well, it's not that I don't accept the pastimes with the gopis, but it's just as you said, when I, when I read them, someone could say the past memories of my interactions come back. So should I push forward and hope to be cleansed, because I do believe I accept the reality of these pastimes, or should I deprive myself and just back off? If the disturbance is such that your actual consciousness is about, you know, my past, uh, my past flings uh, with boys or girls, then, then back off. Um, but... Uh, if despite that you can actually, the whole idea is to be able to absorb, be absorbed uh, in what Krishna is doing. But if you can't be absorbed, then, then it's not going to work. Well, sometimes someone would say, well, then back off for the moment and re refocus and sober up more. And mm -hmm. then you, with a regained... Uh, mm. A moment, a year, mm. something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean, okay, that's it, finished. No, 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 no. I think no, this devotees is... could often think like that, okay, that's that, you know. <laughs> I had this memory of, you know, whatever, and so I guess that's, that's the end of my trying to read Krishna's pastimes. Yeah, here was this, uh, I'll just read what I read to you. It was uh, a... Srila Prabhupada in, uh, in Chaitanya Chaitanya, uh, uh, where does he say it? No, it's Srila Prabhupada's in the uh, uh, teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And very interesting uh, quote, particularly at the end. Prabhupada says, different potencies of the Lord are engaged in the Supreme Lord in different transcendental relationships. They are situated in conjugal love, parental affection, friendship, and in servitude. By impartially judging, one can find that the internal potencies of the Lord who are engaged in conjugal love with the Lord are the best of all devotees. Thus, both internal devotees and confidential devotees are attracted by the conjugal love of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Prabhupada saying that ultimately everybody's attracted uh, by this because this is what Lord Chaitanya uh, came uh, for. These are the most confidential devotees of Lord Chaitanya. Other pure devotees who are more or less attached to Sri Nityananda Prabhu and Advaita Prabhu are attracted by other transcendental relationships such as parental affection, friendship, and servitorship. When such devotees are attached to the activities of Lord Chaitanya, they at once become confidential devotees in conjugal love with the Supreme Lord. So here sort of the bottom line is that once devotees become uh, real staunch followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and absorbed in Lord Chaitanya, uh, then whatever other previous uh, relationship they had or in the case of our conversation that uh, devotees are feel safer uh, reading about something else uh, ultimately by hearing about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes. Then they'll come to the stage of conjugal uh, love, conjugal affection. All right. <laughs> In my loving affairs, there's a person named Madan 
His qualities are thus. Personally, he possesses no gross body, yet he is very expert in giving pains to others. He has five arrows, and fixing them on his bow, he shoots them into the bodies of innocent women. Thus these women become invalids. <laughs> it would be better if he took my life without hesitation, but he does not do so. He simply gives me pain. So it looks like, it sounds like we're getting insight into how Srimati Radharani feels after Krishna left Vrindavan mm. by the way, by via Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Correct. That, that mood of separation. Yeah, we don't hear about the lila or the pastime, but the mood mm. is very much represented. Mm. And, uh, and that comes out, well, especially here, he's giving some introductory, th and then uh, Antya Lila is full of, uh, of these uh, separations and lamentation of the Lord Chaitanya. So that's something we want to pursue, continue reading tomorrow? Why not? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on. And then is this where Kaviraj Goswami writes that uh, I've just given a little taste of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's ecstasy because I'm getting old and I don't know if I'll be able to finish? I can't remember exactly where that is, but I know in the chapter summary, which is based on Bhaktivinoda Thakur's summaries, uh, Prabhupada says that it's very mysterious why Kaviraj Goswami is giving such a summary so early. Hmm. Yeah, very difficult. In the second chapter, we'll just conclude with this. In the second chapter of Madhya Lila, this was the introduction. Uh, the author describes the pastimes the Lord performed during the last 12 years of his life. Thus, he has also described some of the pastimes of Anchalila. Why he has done so is very difficult for an ordinary person to understand. The author expects that reading the pastimes of the Lord will gradually help a person awaken his dormant love of Krishna. Actually, this Chaitanya Charitamrita was compiled by the author during very old age. Therefore, the codes of the Antyalila are also described in the second chapter. Srila Kaviraj Goswami has confirmed that the opinion of Swarup Damodar is authoritative in the matter of devotional service. Over and above this are the notes of Swarup Damodar, memorized by Raghunath Das Goswami, who also helped in the compilation of Chaitanya Charitamrita. After the disappearance of Swarup Damodar Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami went to see Vrindavan. At that time, the author, Srila Kaviraj Goswami, met Raghunath Das Goswami, by whose mercy he also could memorize all the notes. In this way, the author was able to complete this transcendental literature, Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita. All right. Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Devamrita Maharaj ki jai.